Good morning, Texas Baptist College and Southwestern family. It is a blessing to be able to come together to worship our self-revealing God. So let's read together Colossians 1, verses 13 to 17. Please stand up in reverence of God's word. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. estrellas creo y su luz limitó quien sino el señor sol y luna formó movimiento les dio quien sino el señor hace la lluvia venir truenos rugir tus obras grandes son Creation sings of you. Come and 
You may be seated. Good morning. What a delight it is to see you as we gather for worship this morning. We welcome those of you who may be visiting with us to chapel at Southwestern Seminary and Texas Baptist College. It's a delight for us to uh, lift our voices in praise to the Lord today. Thank you for these musicians who are leading us, and we welcome those who are online. We're grateful to have you with us as well. We are led in our worship this morning. Our preacher for the day is Dr. Carl Bradford. Needs no introduction. He's beloved on this campus. Holds the McDowell Chair of Evangelism. Serving our Fish School of Evangelism and Missions. Uh, an outstanding classroom teacher. Uh, growing in his productivity as a scholar. He has recently uh, contributed articles to the history of evangelism and another book on the sufficiency of scripture as well as contributions to the Southwestern uh, Journal of Theology. He leads our evangelistic efforts with our students, faculty, and staff across the campus. He is our representative at the SBC each year as we take the gospel to those cities and we appreciate his not only teaching evangelism, but modeling and exemplifying a commitment to the gospel so readily uh, for all of us to see and from which we can learn uh, as a, an example for us. We are glad that he brought his cheering section with us today. We're so happy to see Andrea, his lovely wife, with us, and I think I see uh, Carl Jr. and Abigail there as well, and we're happy that they could uh, be here. I know that we will hear Dr. Bradford uh, gladly in just a few moments. He'll continue our series through the book of Philippians and we'll be preaching from Philippians chapter 1. So for our scripture reading this morning, I would like to read verses 19 through 26. Philippians chapter 1, would you please hear the word of the Lord. I know this will lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now, as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, if I live in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me, and I don't know which one I should choose. I'm torn between the two. I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Since I am persuaded of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that because of my coming to you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus may abound. This is the word of the Lord. Let us bow together and ask God's blessings upon our time as we worship and hear his word proclaimed. We recognize you this day, O oh God, as our true Lord and bow before you to honor, to worship, to adore, to praise your glorious name. We recognize you as the great I am, the one from the beginning who holds all things together by your powerful word. Thank you for the privilege to lift our voices in praise to you, recognizing Father, Son, and Spirit. Thank you for making yourself known to us through the Lord Jesus Christ and in your holy word. May your spirit move among us today. Work in our hearts. Lead us to repentance. Help us to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love others as ourselves. We acknowledge that we have not loved you as we ought, nor have we loved others as we should and we ask for your forgiveness, and we pray for your help. We pray that you might bring renewal to the Southwestern campus, that you might provide for this seminary, that you might guide our board members as they make important decisions about this place. We pray your hand of blessing and favor would rest upon faculty, students, staff alike. We pray for Dr. Bradford today and ask that your spirit would enable him as he proclaims your word, enable us to respond in ways that would please you. 
Help us to grow in discipleship and faithfulness to Christ through our gathered time this day. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. As you stand together as we continue our worship, lift your voices with us as we sing. How great are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning and teaching everyone, with all wisdom, that we may present everyone Más es digno de adoración, quien más nos libra de las tinieblas, solo el Santo Dios. Ship 
Well, good morning. Good morning, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and Texas Baptist College, my family. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and bring forth God's word. I also would like to give thanks to my wife, Andrea, Carl Jr., my son, Abigail, my daughter, and my mother-in-law, Lois Holmes, for always being a support. Um, every time I have something here or somewhere else, they always come out in support. I also want to recognize my former pastor, my first Texas pastor, Dr. Timothy J. Wilbert. He, yes, yeah, so give him a round of applause. Now, you want to thank him because largely, in part, he is the reason I'm here at Southwestern. He challenged me after losing a job that if money was not an issue, what would I see myself doing? And I told him I would be like Billy Graham and go around and preach crusades. And so after talking with him, we acknowledged that I need to get into the seminary and get training and be prepared for that. And so he took me on a tour here at Southwestern and continued to encourage me that he saw that God's call upon my life as a professor. So I'm glad to have you here today with me. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. And I know that we already read uh, the passage today, but it's just my custom as a preacher to start off reading the passage again before uh, we start into the Word of God. Philippians chapter 1 and if you are able, would you please stand out of respect for God's word? Philippians chapter 1, verses 18b through 26. Philippians chapter 1. The word of the Lord says, Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything 
but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Amen? Let us pray. Oh, eternal Father, we do thank you and we do praise you for this opportunity that we have here today. I do pray, Heavenly Father, that the words that I speak today, that you would guard them, Heavenly Father, that there would be your words, Heavenly Father, that we would see you in this text clearer, Heavenly Father. And we pray today, Heavenly Father, that you will be exalted and those here would be um, edified. Now, Father, be with us. Be our special guest here. Take me out of the way, Heavenly Father, and let my brothers and sisters only see you, Father, and your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you and we praise you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. From this text of scripture today, I want to label our sermon, Confidence in a Future Deliverance. Confidence in a Future Deliverance. Throughout history, believers have experienced trials, sufferings, and sorrows at the expense of participating in the gospel ministry. Yet many somehow maintain confidence or they're able to rejoice in future salvation or deliverance. One example of our time of such fate can be seen in a speech entitled, I've Been to the Mountaintop, by civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who labored tirelessly by preaching the implications of the gospel, namely, inequality for all men. Watch this. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life, longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. This speech would be the final speech of Dr. King. The next day, he would be assassinated. For a significant part of his ministry, he endured threats on his life, beatings, imprisonment, criticism from those that are in favor of inequality by fellow clergymen, and at times even criticism by those, the very people that he labored and proclaimed the implications of the Gospels for. Nevertheless, Dr. King maintained confidence in a future deliverance, even to the very end of his life. In a similar situation, the Apostle Paul is experiencing distress for preaching the gospel. It is here that in Philippians 
chapter 1, verses 18b through 26, we observe that despite Paul's current distress for the gospel, he joyfully awaits his coming deliverance from the God of the gospel. Look in verse 18. We see here a, a turning point of the text as Paul moves from this present state of rejoicing to a future anticipation of rejoicing. Notice his words. He says, I will rejoice. Paul displays an inner con conviction and confidence that he will remain in the state of joy. And despite being in prison and despite facing probability of death and despite the object of ecclesiastic hating, Paul declares that I will rejoice. But how is Paul able to rejoice? And by extension, how are you and I able to rejoice? Maintain a confidence when we experience suffering for participating in the ministry of the Lord. As we look at this text today, we see that Paul rejoices in this present distress and has confidence in a future deliverance because of his insurance, his aim, and the benefit of that future deliverance. Consider with me the first point, the assurance of Paul's deliverance. Notice what he says in verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Paul has an assurance based upon confidence. Despite imprisonment and strife for others, he knows that God will bring about salvation. No one has tipped Paul off that he's going to get out. No one has tipped Paul off of what the circumstance, his destiny is going to be. But nevertheless, Paul is confident. Paul would have a good example of knowing how the law works in a person's life. All he would have to do is go and look at Job. Job, in a similar situation like Paul, suffering. And yet on top of all of that, he has friends that come by and condemn him and say, you're the reason for your suffering. What have you done to God? But Job utters these words. He says, this also will be my salvation. Paul is convinced he knows that this, his imprisonment, his, the mocking of others, the progression of the gospel, all of this will turn out for his deliverance. But what does Paul mean by the term deliverance? Here, when we look at the word, it comes from the Greek word soteria, and it's usually translated salvation. And when you look at scholars and survey what scholars say, some believe that Paul here is talking about a deliverance from prison, a release from prison, a physical deliverance. Others contend that Paul is speaking about an eternal deliverance, one that comes after death. But I personally believe, because of the ambiguity, that Paul has in mind both. Paul is basically saying that, listen, regardless of where one lands, the point is here that Paul doesn't know where his deliverance is going to come from. He just knows that his deliverance will come, and that's okay. He has an assurance that God will deliver him. God will vindicate him one way or another. Paul here says he knows that this will turn out for his deliverance. But understand and notice the means by which Paul is saying this as well. As we move on, he says this is going to happen through the prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul had recently prayed in Philippians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6 for the Philippians. And now he was expecting the community to lobby around him and pray for him and intercede for him as well. Paul, Paul knowing the power of prayer, often relied upon the saints of God to pray for him. Remember in Romans chapter 15, verse 31, Paul requests prayers for him to be rescued from disobedient men in Judea. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 through 11, Paul praised the church for praying for his deliverance from death. And then we see in another situation in Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul solicits prayers that doors may be opened that he may freely be able to preach 
in the gospel. Paul was acquainted with the prayers of the saints. Not only that, Paul had confidence in God's provision made available through the Spirit. Ultimately, what Paul's hope was not in hope itself, but it was in the people of God praying the will of God. That's what Paul hoped was in. You know, this is a good word for us today. To have assurance in God's will for our life. Because the gospel ministry, students, professors, guests, will often take you into places and in situations and circumstances that you find yourself suffering and having sorrow. Money will not be able to get you out of those situations. Your education, your degrees from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and TBC, the best schools in the world, will not be able to get you out of that situation. Your ties to the Southern Baptist Convention or any convention or conference will not be able to get you out of that situation. But you can be sure that because you are of, of the body of Christ, you will always have the people of God praying the will of God. And if you're in the will of God, that's the best place that you can be. Paul had confidence. He had confidence because he knew that this would come about, his deliverance would come about through the prayers of the saints, praying the will of God, and being in the will of God himself. We find an example of that in the Bible. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested for preaching the gospel. Then they're threatened and they're released. And the Bible says that in verse 29, the people of God begin to pray the will of God, and they begin to pray for confidence. And the Bible says in verse 31, when they prayed, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak the word of God with boldness. My brothers and sisters, I'm trying to encourage you today that to let you know that you can be assured that God will deliver you in those times of suffering and sorrow if you're in his will. The means of Paul's assurance. But also notice the motive of Paul's assurance. Paul says here in verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and hope, I will not be put to shame in anything, anything but that with all boldness Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul's hope and expectation is in keeping with God's will, that he is glorified. This is not the aim of every Christian to seek to glorify God. Now, we talk a lot about glorifying God, magnifying God for his glory. Paul here is talking about that we, he, as by extension as us, we need to align our will with the will of God. He's aware that he will soon face Roman tribunal and Paul is not worried about how he will look to others. He says, I will not be put to shame. And when Paul is talking about being put to shame, he's not worrying about how he's going to look to the naysayers. He says, but rather, he wants to exalt God and he wants to glorify God that whether by life or by death, whichever way it comes, he's not going to be put to shame because he's going to stand firm in the will of God. Paul had assurance, a confidence in his future deliverance. And whether by execution or exoneration, Paul wanted to exalt the Lord. And if I can borrow a line from Dr. King, he just wanted to do the Lord's will. Paul had assurance in a future deliverance. But notice second, the aim of Paul's deliverance. The aim of Paul's deliverance. Verse 20 clues us in, clues us in to Paul's discussion that is to come regarding his deliverance. In verses 21 through 24, Paul expresses the idea that Christ is the focus and the aim of his life. Look at what he says. For to me, 
To live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I'm to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. The phrase for me to live is Christ and to die is gain has become somewhat of a Christian slogan, an anthem for many believers. But for Paul, this statement exemplifies the primary aim of his life, namely Christ. It was not just a statement, not just a slogan. Notice what he says. And he says, to live will go on to be fruitful labor. But if I am to live on the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for you. What labor is he talking about? He's talking about this labor, these works of righteousness. Works done through God, by God, through the Holy Spirit. Among these include preaching of the gospel, for which Paul gave his life. Yet on the other hand, Paul says that he has a longing to be with Jesus. See, for death is a loss, but for Paul, it's a gain. He says that I am hard-pressed, and the irony is here, that he is in prison, being oppressed, locked up and chained, but yet he is hard-pressed not because of his imprisonment, but rather he is hard-pressed because of the two possible outcomes. A.T. Robertson says that the word picture you get here is this as Jesus was teaching in crowds and crowds were closing in on him and pressing he had to escape. It's the same picture that you get here that Paul is hemmed in on both sides. He says that he's hard pressed. But don't miss what's happening here. Paul is not in control of his destiny. Paul is not saying, listen, I could choose to stay here or I could choose to go with Christ, but rather Paul is putting forth his argument before us, allowing us to see his, the way that he, he thinks. And he's saying, listen, it's better for me if I be with Christ because I get to get Christ and be face to face with Christ, the one who loved me, the one who died for me, the one who shed blood for me on Calvary's cross. But it may be more, it's more profitable and necessary for me to stay with you. Regardless of how it happens, Paul's life can be summed up, Christ. When Paul lived, it was Christ. When Paul died, it was Christ. Is this unique to Paul? Do we have any people today that think like that, that live their life like that, that their total sum of this life is Christ? Meet Samuel Kaboo Morris, an example of a person who God and Christ was the sum total of his life. A Liberian prince who converted to Christianity around the age of 14. And time will not allow me to tell you about all the things, how people say that he exemplified a Holy Spirit life, a, a life led by God, but yet I want to share at least two things with you about Kabul's life. In life, Christ was his aim. Determined to get to America after receiving Christ, he learned more, to learn more about God, he endured cuffs, curses, and kicks, as one author tell us, in abundance, before and after being allowed to travel to New York on a ship. Once in New York, he labored to learn about God and to preach God consistently and often. One author states that he says, think of this, an uncultured and uncultivated but endowed and filled African under the power of the Holy Spirit on his first day in America, in New York, won 20 souls to Christ. And it were occurrences like these that became the norm. In Kabul's life, it was Christ. But even in his death, the same Arthur recalls these words concerning his death. It said he bore sickness patiently, carefully. He never spoke of pain or disappointment. Coming here 
at 18 and only living to 20, he always spoke thankfulness that Christ Jesus condescended to come and stay with him. When asked, did he fear that? He replied, oh no, since I have found Jesus, that is my friend. For Kaboo, Jesus was his sum total in both life and death. He had no fear of death. What about us? Can that be said of us? Does my life and your life, do we exemplify Christ as our aim? Do we live for ourselves? Do we seek gratification, prestige, positions, titles, accolades? Students, is your aim to just get a degree and and ride off into the sunset and get the best possible, biggest office and the best ministry position paying the largest salary possible? Professors, is your aim to sit back in your office, ride this thing out, forget about sharing the gospel, couple of arguments here and there with faculty members, and we're okay. I want to submit to you, my brothers and sisters, that Christ needs to be the aim of our lives. He needs to be the tum, he needs to be the tum so the 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 total sum of our life. Whether living or dying, it needs to be Christ. Paul's aim was Christ. The total sum of his life was Christ. That's why Paul could pin down these words that's found in Romans chapter uh, 14, verses 7 through 8. For none of us live for ourselves, and none of us die for ourselves. For if we live, we live unto the Lord, and if we die, we die unto the Lord. So therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Can that be said about us today? Here lies a man, here lies a woman, That when he lived, when she lived, it was Christ. And when they died, it was Christ. Paul has assurance and his confidence in a future deliverance. Paul's aim is Christ and his confidence that he has for this future deliverance. And then notice last, we observe the benefit of Paul's deliverance. The benefit of Paul's deliverance. Notice what he says in verse 25. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Paul understood that his deliverance would be a benefit to others more than himself. In other words, Paul saw the ministry of the gospel. He put others first before himself. Can we find that among any people today? He was convinced, and not only convinced, but he knows that they are still in need of progressing in their joy, progressing in their faith. As it relates to faith in chapter 2, he wanted them to have more humility and take on the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. They needed more humility. Paul says, I must stay on because it's necessary that you be taught to have more humility. In chapter 3, he he wanted them to be on guard against false teachers, those bringing in um, things that are adding to the gospel and taking away of the gospel. Paul says, you need to be trained in, in apologetics and know how to defend your faith and be able to point those people out. In chapter 4, he encouraged them that believers can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthened him and by extension strengthens us. He wanted them to know that his God, their God, our God, will supply all our needs and his children according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Paul wanted them to progress in their faith, but also he wanted them to have joy when they were doing it. He didn't want them to go through life and Christianity and their love and their ministry 
is a taskmaster, but rather he wanted them to have joy, even when they are suffering for the gospel, to have joy. That's why he says in Philippians chapter 4 and 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Paul said, I have to say it two times so you can catch on. Again, I say rejoice. Notice the ultimate purpose and benefit of Paul's deliverance. It says, so that because of my coming to you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus may abound. Now, authors and scholars have debated whether Paul was taking and he was boasting because he was coming to them again or whether the boasting was to be found in Christ. But don't miss this. What Paul is saying here is not boasting that he's taking pride in the sense that he is patting himself on the back saying, look at what I can do, but rather he is talking about boasting in Christ. Just as he declares in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 31, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul is proud. Yes, he's proud because these individuals are going to grow up in the Lord. But ultimately, the boasting, the glorification, the exaltation belongs to the Lord. In other words, he says, won't he do it? That's what he was saying. Won't he do it? Paul understood that his ministry to the Philippians was ultimately for the purpose of increasing their bo um, boasting and pride in the Lord, their confidence in the Lord. Your approach to ministry, do you pe put people first? Do you say, listen, I'll be done wrong. I'll take the suffering but I'm going to put them first. The reason you get up and come to school, are you planning to put people first in ministry? Is that your end goal? Professors, when you are in the class with that student, are you looking to put them first? Or do you have the mindset, how dare you talk to me like that? Paul understood that ministry was about people. This is why Paul was able to rejoice in the future deliverance despite his present distress. Paul had confidence in the Lord. Paul had assurance in the Lord. His aim, his total sum of his life was the Lord. And Paul understood that people was the key to ministry. Paul understood that he could overcome. Paul understood that God would deliver him if he would keep his mind focused on him. See, actually what we're talking about here is not that Paul has hope in hope, as I said earlier. It's the fact that Paul's assurance was in God. His aim was God, and ultimately, he wanted more of God. Whether it was preaching to people or whether it was dying, it was all about God. Where did we find confidence like this today? During the Civil Rights Movement, there was a song, a gospel song, originally pinned down in 1901, and through different variations, became the anthem of American Civil Rights Movement. The song gave individuals a sense of confidence and deliverance that someday it will come. No matter the struggle, no matter the trials, just hold on, look to God, and one day it will come. The song is, We Shall Overcome. If you allow me to say a few verses from the psalm, we shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. We are not afraid, we are not afraid, we are not afraid today. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. We are not alone. We are not alone. We're not alone today. 
Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe that we are not alone today. The truth will make us free. The truth will make us free. The truth will make us free someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. And if none of those verses get you excited, listen to this last voice. You, you need to jump out of your seat. The Lord will see us through. The Lord will see us through. The Lord will see us through someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. My brothers and sisters, Students, this is training ground. There's a waiting, a world out there that's ready for the, you to participate in the gospel ministry. And although us as professors and others would love to tell you that the best is yet to come, there will be people who will mock you, people who will be against you, whether you are going over the land, whether you're going over the water, whether you find your gospel ministry in the White House, in the Senate House, or down in the crack house, there will be suffering, there will be sorrow, and there will be trials, whoever puts his hand to the plow for Jesus Christ. But I'm here to tell you today that you will be able to overcome God will bring your deliverance, whether by life or by death. All you need to worry about is making Jesus the sum total of your life. Have confidence in the future deliverance. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, I am not prideful to think that the way that I presented this text today was adequate enough to make anyone's heart be transformed. But we look to you to do the transformation in our lives. For there are some of us here today that we had a wrong idea of ministry and we need a reset and to know that ministry is about God, it's about people and not only that Heavenly Father as we enter in times of suffering and times of sorrows we can count upon the Lord that he will deliver us but then there may just be one here today that's heard all of this and their assurance is not in a future deliverance because they've never been delivered from their sin. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will work in our hearts in such a way, regardless of what area we fall in, that after the day someone would come and talk to me, someone would come and talk to Dr. Dockery, someone would come and talk to Dr. Queen, or any of our professors, or any of our students, or any of our guests, they would find someone that could give them the true assurance and the confidence of Christ. God, we want to say we love you and we thank you. Now do what only you can do and work in our heart in such a way that we draw closer to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In response to the word of God, let's stand up and sing this song as a prayer. Your will be done, my God and Father, as in heaven, so on earth. My heart is drawn to self assaulting. Help me seek your kingdom first. As Jesus walked, so shall I walk, held by your same unchanging love. Still my soul, I'll leave your voice and pray, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Wondrous 
When I am lost and I am broken in the night of fear and doubt, still I will trust in my good Father. Yes, to one great King I bow. As Jesus rose, so I shall rise in ransom glory at the throne. My heart restored with all your saints I sing. Father, not my will, but yours be done. As we go forth, our God and Father, lead us daily in the fight that all the world might see your glory and your name be lifted high and in his name we overcome for you shall see us safely home now as your church we lift our voice and pray Live with this benediction from Colossians 3, verses 15 to 17. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. You are dismissed.